by four incredible practitioners, thinkers, as Eric would say, catalyzers of these ideas. I'm going to introduce them now. To Matt's left is Keith Hickman. He's a restorative justice expert, and I would say we would call him an ambassador for restorative justice, having taught these methods and practices across the United States and in Jamaica. Um, one thing that's interesting about Keith is in 2000, he helped to found the Youth Justice Project at the Harlem Community Justice Center in partnership with the Center for Court Innovation. Uh, and I've done a lot of work with the Center for Court Innovation, so um, that's sort of the gold standard, I think, of restorative justice practices. So Keith, I thought it might be nice at this point as the restorative justice expert to sort of take it up a level. We've heard two examples, actually multiple examples, because IFRA offered some different ideas about different things going on at, at Rainier. Um, if you could give a sense of the kind of work you do, but also, um, you know, direct those comments to uh, more of an analysis of what you see in the programs that we've just heard about and how it resonates with the restorative justice practices that you teach across the country. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Eric, uh, Citizen Jew. And I particularly want to thank Committee for Children um, for hosting IRP uh, and, and inviting us to this wonderful conference and at the work that we're doing in terms of uh, integrating and breaking down silos across the education reform movement is huge. Um, so I'll start with just adding some more weight to this. I am the director of continuing education for the Institute, International Institute for Restorative Practices, and the institute itself uh, is the only graduate school in the country that offers a master's in science and a graduate certificate in restorative practices. So that's pretty big in and of itself. What we're aiming to do is we are an emerging social science that is studying uh, how to build social capital and how to achieve social discipline through participatory learning and decision making. The hypothesis of what we're trying to present in tests is that people are most likely and happier and willing to be productive and cooperative when those in position of authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. So what we've created is we created a whole framework, a whole framework of support systems that we teach, train, and, and, and push out across various sectors including education, the criminal justice system, uh, organizational leadership, uh, social services, uh, and uh, family engagement and family work. Uh, and that, that's really important. So to contextualize this, it is an actual movement across the country now that we are pushing more and more zero tolerance policy out the door. So in my role and in my work, to just add more light to it, last year we trained over 10,000 people in restorative practices. What does that equal in terms of the transformation that's happening across the country? If you look at places like Los Angeles, Los Angeles Unified School District, Oakland with Arjoy, uh, Chicago, every urban area, and recently uh, half the schools in Pittsburgh under a DOJ grant uh, in partnership with RANCOR, uh, you're seeing enormous shifts and changes in the climate in terms of the reduction of sus suspensions and uh, building equity across the board in terms of resources and what's happening in schools. So in terms of data points and what we've been able to see, um, in the schools that implement restorative practices at a high fidelity rate, and high fidelity meaning that they're doing uh, all the essential elements in all the work on a consistent and explicit basis, and it's a part of the fabric of the school and the district, those schools have seen decreases in suspensions and increases in school climate change. So decreases in suspensions as much as 80 to 90 percent in about a year or two. Mm. And the important piece to that is it's not just restorative practices, but it's the integration of the framework, the very body of restorative practices into the other programs that are already existing in schools like social emotional learning. So, 
one of the themes that I want to continue to carry with me across the country is it's, it's really important that we begin to break down silos and begin to integrate this work. When I go into schools and we talk about restorative practices, one of the first thing I hear, one of the first things that comes out of teachers and principals' mouths are, I don't have time to do another program. Oh, it's another program. It's the flavor of the month, which is true. So time and space are two things that schools are uh, struggling with. Um, and so I'll give you an example. Um, when I do trainings and I ask a group of folks in the room, how many times do you come together to have these kinds of conversations or even discuss this? Oftentimes they'll tell me it's the first time they've ever gathered as a staff. So what that tells me is we're not creating time and space for educators and, and professionals to come together to support each other. And what's happening is if we don't do that work, we're creating and contributing to a climate of blame and shame. Yeah. And a climate of blame and shame is directly impacting and, filled, and making its way down into the classroom and impacting our students. So we talk about the numbers of suspension. Actually, a good friend of mine, Henry McClendon, who works for Skillman Foundation, he says, we have a suspension problem, but what's more important is we have a relationship problem. And that's what restorative practices focuses on, building, rebuilding relationships. <laughs>